of Management Studies IGNU presents an audio book on the course MMPC002 Human Resource Management for MBA program. Presenting Block 4 Employer Employee Relations Unit 13 Grievance Handling and Discipline Management Procedures Part 3 Disciplinary Action Procedure To start with, based on any misconduct committed by the employee or a complaint, a preliminary inquiry is called for. Then disciplinary authority has to initiate action. The authorities that are laid by the organization for various levels of employees are number 1. Disciplinary authority, appellate authority and reviewing authority. Based on judicial pronouncement, elaborate procedure have been evolved which has to be followed to avoid infirmities in the disciplinary action. Various stages that are involved are number 1. Preliminary inquiry number 2. Framing and serving of charge sheet number 3. Holding of domestic inquiry number 4. Report of the inquiry officer number 5. Consideration of the report of the inquiry officer by disciplinary authority. Number six, order of punishment and its communication. And number seven, appeal. Issue of the charge sheet. Delinquent employee is to be issued a charge sheet call for him to submit his explanation within a specified period of time. This charge sheet should be drafted in a clear and unambiguous language so that the workman does not have any difficulty in understanding the charges that he has to answer. Wherever possible, the relevant clause of the company's standing orders should be mentioned in a charge sheet. If the charge relates to an incident, the date, time and place of the occurrence should be mentioned. Proper care should be taken in framing the charge sheet for the validity of the punishment would depend on the inquiry of the misconduct mentioned in the charge sheet. The charge sheet should be in the local language. The charge sheet framed against delinquent employee and duly signed by the disciplinary authority should be served on him personally if possible and acknowledgement to the effect should be obtained from him. In case the workman is absent or if he refuses to accept the charge sheet when presented to him, the same should be sent to his local and home address by post under registered cover with acknowledgments due after getting his refusal attested by two witnesses. In case the charge sheet is returned unserved with the remarks of the postal authorities, the same should be kept intact without opening. In such a case, the employer should display the charge sheet on the notice board or act in accordance with the provisions of the standing orders. In some cases, it may be necessary to public the content of the charge sheet in a local newspaper having wide publicity. Suspension pending inquiry In a case where the charges leveled against a workman are of serious nature and it is considered by the disciplinary authority that his physical presence might endanger the safety of other workmen or if it is apprehended that he might intimidate others or tamper with the evidence, he may be suspended. During the period of suspension pending inquiry, the workman will get subsistence allowance as per rules. Number 3. Consideration of the Explanation after a charge sheet has been served on a workman for reply, he may submit his explanation. Number 1. Admitting the charges and requesting for mercy. Or number 2. Denying the charges and requesting for an inquiry. Or number 3. Not submitting any explanation at all. Or number 4. Requesting for more time to submit explanation. In a case where the workman admits a charge which is of a minor nature and begs for mercy, no inquiry is held and decision is taken accordingly on the charge sheet. If, however, the misconduct is serious enough to warrant discharge or dismissal, the management should still arrange to hold a proper inquiry, the admission of the charges notwithstanding. In a case where the workman submits an explanation mentioning that the charges leveled against him are false, baseless, motivated, concocted, etc., 
A proper inquiry as per procedure should be held before awarding any punishment. When the workman concerned makes a bona fide request on reasonable grounds for extension of time to submit explanation, the same should be granted. Notice for holding the inquiry. After consideration of the explanation of the charge sheeted workman or when no reply is received within the specified time limit, the disciplinary authority should issue an order appointing an inquiry officer or an inquiry committee to hold the inquiry of the charge sheet. The inquiry officer can be an official of the company or even an outsider, but care should be taken to appoint only such a person as an inquiry officer who is neither a witness nor is personally interested in any way in the matter for which the charge sheet has been issued. It should also contain the name of the management representative. Therefore, the inquiry officer should issue a notice of inquiry. This notice of inquiry should clearly mention the date, time and place of inquiry. It should ask the workman to present himself with his witnesses or documentary evidence, if any, for the inquiry. It should also be mentioned in the notice of inquiry that if the workman fails to attend the inquiry on the appointed date and time, the same will be held ex parte. A reasonable period of time should be given to the workman for preparing his defence before the inquiry is held. Holding of the inquiry The object of holding an inquiry is to find out whether the workman is guilty of the charges levelled against him in the charge sheet or not. In doing so, the inquiry officer gives the workman a reasonable opportunity to defend himself by cross-examining the witnesses or documentary evidence or exhibits produced against him and by examining the witnesses or documentary evidence in his defence. The workman concerned can also make statement in his defence apart from what is stated in reply to the charge sheet. It should be clearly understood that it is for the management's representative, that is, evidence officer, to prove the charges against a workman by adducing evidence during the inquiry and it is not the workman who has to prove his innocence. Unless management side has been able to prove the case against the workman, he should not be considered guilty. The Inquiry On the appointed date and time fixed for the inquiry, certain persons should be present apart from the inquiry officer. They are number 1. Presenting Officer he is the person who will lead the case from the management side by producing witnesses and relevant documentary evidence in support of the charge. He may himself be a witness, in which case he is the first person to be examined. The presenting officer has a right to cross-examine a charge-sheeted workman as well as the witness or documentary evidence produced by him. Number 2. Delinquent Employee no inquiry can be said to have been held as per procedure in the absence of the charge sheeted employee. However, if he refuses to take part in the inquiry after presenting himself or when he does not report for the inquiry despite receiving the notice to him, the inquiry may proceed ex parte provided in the notice of the inquiry a specific mention to that effect has been made. Also, if during the inquiry the delinquent employee withdraws himself, the same may be held ex parte. In such a case, it is not advisable to postpone the inquiry and give another opportunity to the delinquent employee rather than holding ex parte inquiry. In a case where the delinquent employee turns up for the inquiry after some witnesses have been examined, it would be proper for the inquiry officer to allow him to participate in the inquiry after recording this fact in the proceedings. The inquiry officer should recall the witnesses who have already been examined in the absence of the delinquent employee so that he gets an opportunity to cross-examine such witnesses. Number 3. Representative of the delinquent employee. If the delinquent employee writes to the charge sheet or makes a subsequent request that he should be allowed to take a knowledgeable co-worker of his choice to assist him in the inquiry, the same should normally be allowed. In some companies, union committee member of the recognized trade union is allowed to attend an inquiry on the specific request of the workman to either assist him or play the role of an observer as per procedure.
Next is the procedure of inquiry. At the commencement of the inquiry, if the delinquent employee is present, the inquiry officer should record the date, time and place of inquiry, names of the persons present and obtain their signatures on the order sheet. Thereafter, he should proceed as per the certain steps. Number 1. Read out and explain the charges and the reply of the charge sheet to the delinquent employee and get his confirmation to that effect. In case the delinquent employee has not accepted the charge in reply to the charge sheet, he should be asked if he pleads guilty of the charges. If the charges are admitted, that should be recorded and signatures of all concerned with date should be taken. A full-fledged inquiry need not be held if the misconduct is of a minor nature. In case the charge, if proved, is serious enough to warrant discharge or dismissal, the proper course is to hold the inquiry. Number 2. Explain to the delinquent employee concerned the procedure to be followed in the inquiry. Ways that the presenting officer will produce witnesses, documentary evidence and exhibits in support of the charge and the delinquent employee will have the opportunity to cross-examine. Thereafter, the delinquent employee should be given opportunity to produce his witnesses and the management representative will have a right to cross-examine them. Number 3. The delinquent employee will have further opportunity to make statement, if any, in his defence. At any stage of the inquiry, the inquiry officer can seek clarification from any witness or the delinquent employee by puffing questions to him. Neither the presenting officer nor the delinquent employee can put leading questions to their respective witnesses. Number 4. Witnesses in support of the charge are to be examined one by one in the presence of the delinquent employee. Number 5. The charge sheeted workman is to be given an opportunity to cross-examine management's witnesses. In case he declines to cross-examine any witness, an endorsement to that effect should be recorded by the inquiry officer. Number 6. The delinquent employee should be asked to produce his own witnesses one by one and the presenting officer will be allowed to cross-examine them. The delinquent employee should be asked to give his statement after his witnesses are examined and cross-examined. He may also produce documentary evidence, if any. In case the delinquent employee declines to produce any witness or documentary evidence or declines to give any statement, the inquiry officer should make a record to that effect in the order sheet and obtain signatures of all concerned. If the inquiry remains incomplete in the first sitting and some more witnesses are required to be examined, it may be continued on any other day, mutually agreed by both the sides. In such a case, the inquiry officer should make a suitable endorsement in the order sheet and obtain signatures of all concerned. Number 7. On each page of the inquiry proceedings, the signature with date of the charge sheeted workman, his representative if any, the concerned witness and the management representative should be taken. The concerned witness should sign on each page of his statement only. And number 8. The inquiry officer will sign on each page of the proceedings after endorsing that the statement has been recorded by him and explained to the parties in their language before they were asked to sign. If the delinquent employee refuses to put his signature even after he had been asked to do so, the inquiry officer should make an endorsement to that effect and get it attested by others present. Next is ex-party inquiry. If on the day fixed for the inquiry, the delinquent employee does not turn up, an ex-party inquiry may be held by following the usual procedure. In such an inquiry, the presenting officer has to lead the evidence against the charge-sheeted workman. The inquiry officer, by putting questions to the witnesses, get facers to come to reasonable conclusion about the validity or otherwise of the charges. As stated earlier, it is advisable to fix another date of inquiry instead of holding an ex-party inquiry on the first sitting itself. And finally comes the inquiry report. After the inquiry is over, the inquiry officer makes an appreciation of the evidence on record and comes to his conclusion. If there is no corroborative evidence on a particular point, the inquiry officer has to give his own reasons for accepting or rejecting the evidence of such a witness. 
The inquiry report is a document which should clearly indicate whether the charges leveled against the delinquent employee are proved or not. The conclusion of the inquiry officer should be logical and based only on evidence brought out during the inquiry. The inquiry officer may record clearly and precisely his conclusions with reasons for the same. There is no place for any conjecture or surmises in the inquiry report. It should be such that, as per the evidence on record, any impartial man not connected with the case should be able to come to the same conclusion as that of the inquiry officer. Then comes final decision of the disciplinary authority. The inquiry report is submitted to the disciplinary authority. Before he takes a decision on the findings of the inquiry officer, he is required to furnish a copy of the inquiry officer's report to the concerned employee. If he agrees with the findings of the inquiry officer, after considering the gravity of the misconduct and the past record of the delinquent employee, equitable treatment with precedence of action taken, etc., he may pass an order on the quantum of punishment after recording his reasons for the same in writing. An order in writing is passed to that effect and is communicated to the delinquent employee. In case the disciplinary authority decides to punish the employee for his misconduct, then there are certain punishments which it can impose depending upon the severity of the misconduct. There are two kinds of punishment. Number one, minor punishments. They include warning or censor, fine, that is keeping the provisions of Section 8 of Payment of Wages Act in view, and withholding of increment, that is either with cumulative effect or non-cumulative effect. And number two is major punishments. They include demotion, discharge and dismissal. A letter communicating the order of discharge or dismissal should set out clearly the charges proved against the delinquent employee and the date from which the order is to become effective. Normally, the order of discharge or dismissal should be effective from the date of the order unless there is an express provision in the standing orders to the contrary. Appeal An employee can appeal against an order imposing upon him any of the penalties. The appellate authority may confirm, enhance, reduce or set aside the penalty. Conclude It is the employer's right to direct its internal administration and maintain discipline. However, before passing an order of discharge or dismissal, the employer has to arrange for a fair and proper inquiry in consonance with the principles of natural justice. The reason is that its decision may not be reversed by the adjudicator at a later date if the workman raises an industrial dispute challenging the order. A domestic inquiry need not be conducted in accordance with the technical requirements of a criminal trial, but they must be fairly conducted and in holding them, consideration of fair play and natural justice must govern the conduct of the inquiry officer. A domestic inquiry must be conducted with an open mind, honestly and bona fide with a view to determine whether the charge framed against the delinquent employee is proved or not. In today's context, no employer can discharge or dismiss a delinquent workman even for a serious misconduct without following an elaborate procedure for taking disciplinary action. An employer can be guilty and penalized if the adjudicator finds that there was want of good faith or there was victimization or unfair labor practices or the management was guilty of a basic error or violation of a principle of natural justice or on the grounds that the finding was completely baseless or perverse. Legal Provisions Relating to Discharge or Dismissal under Industrial Disputes Act 1947 Individual Dispute Individual disputes are not covered by the Industrial Disputes Act 1947 except dispute of an individual workman relating to his discharge, dismissal, retrenchment and termination from service which is to be considered as an industrial dispute under the Act Section 2A. 
prior to introduction of Section 2A. In 1971, an employer could discharge or dismiss a workman for misconduct as per standing orders after following the procedure for conducting a domestic inquiry. The management's decision could not have been challenged before the Labour Court if inquiry was fairly and properly conducted as per the principles of natural justice. The court could not interfere with quantum of punishment. However, court has powers to interfere only when there was want of good faith or there was victimization or unfair labour practice or violation of principles of natural justice or findings were completely baseless or perverse. Position under Section 2A Section 11A was inserted in the Act by the Industrial Disputes Amendment Act 1971 with effect from 15th of December 1971. The statement of objects and reasons specifically referred to the decision of the Supreme Court in Indian Iron and Steel Company Limited and another versus their workmen. It also referred to recommendation number 119 of the International Labour Organization that a worker aggrieved by the termination of his employment should be entitled to appeal against the termination, among others, to a neutral body such as an arbitrator, a court, an arbitration committee or a similar body. Effect of Section 2A Prior to the introduction of Section 2A, the tribunal had no power to interfere with the finding of misconduct recorded in the domestic inquiry unless there existed one or other infirmities pointed out by the Supreme Court in the case of Indian Iron and Steel Company Limited. The conduct of disciplinary proceedings and punishment to be imposed were all considered to be managerial function, which the tribunal had no power to interfere unless the finding was perverse or the punishment was so harsh as to lead an interference or victimization or unfair labor practice. But now, under this section, the tribunal is clothed with the power to reappraise the evidence in the domestic inquiry and satisfy itself whether the said evidence relied on by employer established the misconduct alleged against a workman. The limitations imposed on the powers of the tribunal by the decision in the Indian Iron and Steel Company Limited can no longer be invoked by an employer. Where the Lingam J. held, and I quote, The tribunal is now at liberty to consider not only whether the finding of misconduct recorded by an employer is correct, but also to defer from the said finding if a proper case is made out. What was once largely in the realm of the satisfaction of employer has ceased to be so, and now it is the satisfaction of the tribunal that finally decides the matter. Unquote. Ultimately, the tribunal may hold that the misconduct itself is not proved or that the misconduct proved does not warrant the punishment of dismissal or discharge. Under this section, for the first time, power has been given to tribunal to satisfy itself whether misconduct is proved. This is particularly so regarding even findings arrived at by an employer in an inquiry properly held. The tribunal has also been given power for the first time to interfere with the punishment imposed by an employer. Have now been conferred on tribunals, the legislature obviously felt that some restrictions have to be imposed regarding what matters could be taken into account. Such restrictions are found in the provision. The provision only emphasizes that the tribunal has to satisfy itself one way or the other regarding misconduct punishment and relief to be granted to workmen only on the basis of the materials on record before it. Section 2A does not cover retrenchment or retirement cases because the section clearly indicates that it is for discharge and dismissal cases only. And last is Industrial Disputes Amendment Act 1982. An employer may be held guilty of unfair labor practice in case court finds dismissal or discharge is to be on account of victimization. Secondly, not in good faith. Thirdly, in utter disregard of natural justice. Fourthly, for patently false reasons or disproportionate punishment. 
Apart from the remedy of reinstatement of workmen, the employer is liable for the penalty under Section 254. Now let's summarize the unit. In the first part of the unit, we have discussed about grievance handling. A grievance is a form of discontent or dissatisfaction. There are several reasons for this and grievance has several adverse effects on production, employer and individual employee. There are several channels for discovering grievances. Machinery for grievance handling procedure has been described and a model grievance handling procedure has been provided at the end of the unit. The second part of the unit examined various aspects of discipline. We have seen that discipline is by and large a result of the culture and the pattern of authority or power that are available in an organization. There are specific purpose and objectives of disciplinary actions in an organization. A typical disciplinary action procedure has 10 steps. There are few legal provisions relating to discharge or dismissal under Industrial Disputes Act 1947. You were listening to the audiobook by the School of Management Studies IGNU for MBA program. Course code MMPC002 Human Resource Management. Course coordinator Professor Nantara Padhi from School of Management Studies IGNU. Voice over by Harpreet Kaur. Edited by Taranum Jahan. Program assisted by Jagbandhu Jana. Program produced by Dr. Manoj Kumar Singh. This program was brought to you by Electronic Media Production Center of Indira Gandhi National Open University.